I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, the passing of a world icon who for more than 50 years was a living legend and a man who came to symbolize throughout the world humanity's striving for peace and harmony, the greatest, Muhammad Ali, who succumbed to a long bout with Parkinson's, which he handled with a grace that has been an inspiration to many who must cope with his disease, and then specifically to a septic infection that took his life at the age of 74. It's obvious to any of you who watch JBS on a regular basis that our focus on this channel is events that impact the Jewish world, the state of Israel, American Jewry, Jewish communities everywhere. We normally do not focus on issues outside the Jewish sphere. There are reasons why we are spending a moment remembering and honoring the life and work of Muhammad Ali. First, he touched the lives of many people who happen to be Jewish and anyone who either follows boxing or is a fan of athletics knew and respected the remarkable accomplishments of a young man born Cassius Clay the descendant of a great-grandfather who was a slave, who at the age of 18 won a boxing gold medal at the 1960 Olympics in Rome. Then four years later, at the age of 22, became heavyweight champion of the world by a totally surprising TKO, technical knockout, of then-champion Sonny Liston, and who then went on to defend his title seven times before it was stripped from him for his refusing to enter the military during the Vietnam War, and he lost three and a half years of his prime boxing years. Ultimately, he would become the only fighter in boxing history ever to win the heavyweight crown three separate times, and in 1999, Sports Illustrated named him Sportsman of the Century. The day after his first title win over Sonny Liston in 1964, he changed his name from Cassius Clay, a slave name, to Muhammad Ali and became part of the 1960s civil rights movement on behalf of the black African-American community. Many in America at first hated Muhammad Ali for changing his name, for rejecting Christianity, for embracing Islam, and then for refusing military service as a conscientious objector and as a Muslim cleric. Ultimately, however, it all changed, and Muhammad Ali went from villain to most widely acclaimed hero. The Supreme Court ruled in his favor in 1971, upholding his right to reject military service on religious grounds. And as Americans came to see the mistake of the Vietnam War, Ali's stand against the draft and against the war were seen as models for courageous, nonviolent protest. And by the time his boxing career came to an end in 1978, Ali was appreciated for his artistic boxing superstar style, the superstar that he was, and was understood to be poking fun at everyone, including himself, with his braggadocious style, often in rhyme. And float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, the Ali shuffle, the rope-a-dope, all became part of American lore not simply boxing mythology. To many in the boxing world, he was simply the greatest of all time. But it was what Muhammad Ali did outside the ring which truly turned him into a man revered by most of the world. He became a one-man ambassador of peace, a heavyweight champion who became known as a man of peace with his own marvelous, unique sense of humor, and a gentleness of personality. His became the most recognizable face on the planet Earth, 
as he was celebrated in capitals throughout the Western world, and even more so throughout the African continent. And then there's the Jewish connection. Most people are totally unaware that Muhammad Ali had any Jewish connection, and it goes beyond Howard Cosell. But if you're ever in a trivia contest, and the question is asked, which heavyweight champion had a grandson who had a bar mitzvah ceremony, you now know the answer is Muhammad Ali. Ali's daughter, Khalia Ali, married a Jew, Spencer Wertheimer, and their son, Jacob, had a bar mitzvah ceremony held at Philadelphia's congregation, Rod of Shalom, and Muhammad Ali was in the congregation for his grandson's bar mitzvah. Nor was this the only connection Muhammad Ali had to the Jewish community. And one prominent member of our community who knew him personally joins us now by phone to give his perspective on this American icon. I'm so pleased to be joined by Ron Tarosian, founder, president, and CEO of his own public relations firm in New York City called 5W. He's also a deeply passionate Jew, profoundly committed to the state of Israel. Ron, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Ron, you knew Muhammad Ali? Yeah, um, I spent a day with him, a uh, full day with him a number of years ago. What was the circumstance? Um, at the time, I was representing his daughter, uh -huh. uh, Rashida Ali, who uh, wrote a book at the time. And um, she called me in the morning and said, you know, my dad is coming to town for the day. Would you like to spend the day with him? Wow. And um, we had to figure out what to do with him, um, you know, which is uh, no easy task. You know, you get a call saying, Muhammad Ali is going to be in New York. What do you do with him? <laughs> yes. Um, By the way, were you a fan? Uh, you know, I, who, who can't be a fan of Muhammad Ali? You know, Muhammad Ali was American greatness. Um, I think Muhammad Ali was somebody that was a larger-than-life figure. So, you know, who could not be somebody mm -hmm. that says, you know, wow, Muhammad Ali was something special? He was. Yes. You know, um, Bowie, what, what, what was he like, you, you know, the tone of the man, even though you only spent a day with him? You got a sense of who he was? He was clearly somebody very special. He was clearly somebody very deep. Um, he was clearly somebody who knew the power of who he was. Um, I found him to be very down-to-earth. I found him to be very cognizant of who he was. Um, you know, there was an aura about him. There was an aura about the man which, which you know, was very clear from, you know, from spending, I mean, I spent, you know, a full day with him. Yes. Um, it was very clear from spending time with him that there was an aura of greatness about him. Now, you know, Ron, there are many stories that reference the fact that um, he was you know, a fighter. He also said some disparaging things about Jewish promoters in the boxing game. And then when he visited two Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, he spoke out against Israel and called Israelis Zionist invaders who, be, who should be ousted from the Palestinian homeland. As you experienced him, did he seem to be anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, and as you knew his daughter, was there any of that in the family that you experienced? Look, like many others, I've read the stories. Um, I certainly personally didn't experience any of those things. Um, you know, he was in my office, and, you know, in my personal office wall, I have a picture of Zeb Jabotinsky on my wall yes. and a picture of the Chabad Rebbe in my office. Yes. Um, I personally didn't, you know, experience any of those things. Um, look, I, I, I think that, you know, from what I know about Muhammad Ali, and again, from the day that I spent with him, I think that this man was somebody that wanted to make the world a better place. Yes. Um, you know, he wasn't a politician, and I'm sure I wouldn't share, you know, the views of many on uh, the state of Israel, and certainly not, you know, with him. But I think that this was a man who was, you know, as he said, somebody who has the same viewpoints on the world at the age of 50 as they had at the age of 20 is clearly somebody who you know, has wasted their life. I think that there's a lot of things that are said about Muhammad Ali, which might not necessarily, necessarily reflect who Muhammad Ali is. 
Yes. Now, Ron, you are also a student of Jewish life. You're one of the most active and vocal individuals on the Jewish scene today, and you are, you know, you're one of those who leads the Jewish community. One of the issues I hear discussed now is the extent to which there is tension between the African-American community and the Jewish community. And here, Muhammad Ali was a Muslim, and he did certain things that we're going to talk about that were very much supportive of individual Jews. But I want to ask you to speak on the, the broader issue. As you look at African-American Jewish relations today, and it's in the backdrop of who a Muhammad Ali was, what troubles you, and at the same time, what do you feel gives you hope? Look, you know, I was, um, I am somebody who was for many years and still is, you know, involved in Jewish activism. And I find for many years that there are those in the African-American community who are very divisive when it comes to Israel, um, who are very much, you know, outspoken in the wrong way when it comes to Israel. I, I, you know, for me, natural allies are the African American community and the Jewish community, and I yes. say that as somebody who is, you know, decidedly not a liberal, decidedly yes. not a, uh, you know, uh, student necessarily of, you know, those who say that the African American community you know, has the right to stand against Israel. Look, I think that there's many great things that Muhammad Ali said. But, I, you know, he said that I wish the whole world would love each other as much as they love me. Yes. Um, and I think that, you know, that, I think that that's true. I think that, um, you know, for the Jewish community, the Jewish community needs to love ourselves. We need to spend more time loving ourselves. And I think that those certainly who follow the African-American community, I say to my African-American brothers and sisters, I always say, you know, the words of Martin Luther King, of course, are when somebody talks about Zionists, it is code word for Jews. And no matter where you stand on the political spectrum, I think that that is the truth. I think that, you know, we're now seeing a schism in the Democratic Party, certainly, where there is, you know, platforms and talking about voting against, you know, Jerusalem and the platform on Israel and things like that. And as terrible a president as I think Barack Obama has been for the state of Israel, I don't think that's anything to do with the fact that he's African American. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that has anything to do with it. I think the fact of the matter is he's been terrible for the state of Israel. Um, you know, I, I, Muhammad Ali was simply for me a great American. I think, you know, there's so many wonderful things that the man spoke about. You know, this whole debate about Cassius Clay versus Muhammad Ali. A man in this country has the right to be called the name that he wants. Of course. And, and he was very comfortable in his skin. And I think, it would be, it, I, I, for me, that's such a beautiful and amazing thing. I wish the Jewish community was more comfortable in their skin. Yes. I think that, you know, it's just beautiful the way that Muhammad Ali was so comfortable and so proud of being black. I think that's awesome. I don't think that's something to be threatened by. I think that's something just great, and I wish the Jewish community would embrace more of that. Um, I think Muhammad Ali was just a great American. He was just, to me, a great man. And, you know... Did he have things that were bad that he said about Jews, about Palestinians? Yes, and we all make mistakes, and we all say things that, you know, we might mean on one day of the week and on one hour of the week. I don't think that those define the man. I think Muhammad Ali is somebody who is defined by changing the world for a better place. I think Muhammad Ali is somebody who is a role model to so many different people, and I think, you know, the passing of Muhammad Ali leaves the world a little bit darker today than it was yesterday. Ron, it is always wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for giving us some time. We'll talk again soon, and we also have to talk politics. That's not the point of this conversation, but I'm always anxious to have you participate. So I will chase you, but in the meantime, you be well. And again, thank you for the time. Thank you, Mark. Be well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. The thoughts of Ron Tarosian, founder, president, CEO of his own public relations firm in New York, 5W. Well, there's another story that's not well known. Muhammad Ali became part of a Jewish tragedy, one that involved a gorgeous and talented Jew, a journalist for the Wall Street Journal, Daniel Pearl, who was kidnapped by terrorists in Karachi, Pakistan in 2002, who announced that they would execute Daniel as a spy for the United States if America did not meet a set of their demands. And here's where Muhammad Ali 
entered the story. And to tell us something about what Muhammad Ali did, I am so pleased to have on our JBS phones from Los Angeles, California, a man you've met before on L'Chaim, with whom I've had the enormous privilege to sit and who's remained a friend from that moment to this, Dr. Yehuda Pearl, who in addition to being a computer scientist and philosopher, who's won countless awards in his field of artificial intelligence, is also the father of Daniel Pearl, and together with his wife Ruth, is the founding president of the Daniel Pearl Foundation. Yehuda, thank you for joining us once again. It's so good to have you on our phones. Well, thank you, Mark. It's great to have you on your program. Yehuda, before we talk about Muhammad Ali's involvement in the events surrounding your son, Daniel, there may be some in our JBS audience who still do not remember the circumstances that took your son's life in 2002. Would you please give us a summary of where Daniel was in his life and his career at the time he was kidnapped and then murdered, beginning January 23rd, 2002? Danny was uh, serving as the South uh, Asia chief of the Wall Street Journal at the time stationed in Bombay. But he uh, went to Karachi to interview a Muslim cleric yes. uh, connected with the shoe bomber in Paris. And um, he was taken for an interview. He thought he was going to an interview, and he was kidnapped. And uh, from, uh, at that time, we were extremely concerned for his life, and uh, we were totally helpless. Yes. Because uh, you know, not communication with this um, segment of the Muslim community in Pakistan was totally uh, nil. Yes. So we uh, were searching for a personality. Muslim personalities who is number one respected all over the world and number two will be willing to uh, uh, take a, make a statement on Danny's behalf and uh, we were <coughs> trying several uh, leaders uh, one of them was Louis Farrakhan and the other one was the uh, because Muhammad Ali came first. And uh, to our surprise, uh, Muhammad uh, Ali did, did not hesitate for a moment. Amazing. He said, I'll do it. I'll do it tonight, he said. And the next day, uh, the article with his plea was translated into Urdu and published in all the papers in Pakistan. Yeah, it, that gave us you know, a, a week of hope. Yes. A great week of hope, and we really needed it. It wasn't effective, as we all know. Yes. And by that time, I think Danny was already dead, but we didn't know that until three weeks later. <clears throat> I must uh, note here that Louis Farrakhan told us that he's not ready. And by the time he was ready, it was too late. Amazing. Uh, Jesse Jackson, after the, uh, after the plea of Muhammad Ali came public, uh, Jesse Jackson saw it as a license to do his own, and he also came up with a plea. Uh, but uh, you know, Muhammad was really made a, a statement that no one could resist. What I remember from that statement was a sentence treating as you would wish all Muslims to be treated by others. Yes. That's how he pleaded, and uh, he, he, it gave us a week of hope. Yes. As you say, in the end, of course, his plea was rejected by the terrorists in Karachi, and your son was, in fact, executed. Um, incidentally, we should again tell... Any, how old was Daniel when this happened to him? 38. 38 years old. 
He had a wife. He had a family. He had a pregnant wife. Yes. Uh, yeah. And she subsequently did give birth, correct? She, yeah, on May 29, just a few days ago, she gave birth to uh, my grandson, Adam. Adam yeah. Pearl. Yes. Uh, I want you to remind our audience of the last words, virtually the last words, that Daniel uttered before he was executed. Yes, he said the famous word, uh, I'm Jewish. Uh, my father is Jewish, my mother is Jewish, I'm Jewish. And he spent uh, many uh, visits to Israel. He said that uh, in, back in the town of Bray Brak, there is a street named after my grandfather, Yes, uh, Chaim Pearl, who was one of the founders of the town. It's an amazing story. Your son had amazing courage. And I told you when I sat with you, it is, it is something that tears at the heart of the Jewish people. From the day we learned he had been executed, murdered, to this day, and you know every time I have any dealings with you, I always tell you that I remain so sorry. And in some way, but you know, nothing, nothing you could ever do, nothing the foundation could ever do, nothing Muhammad Ali could ever do uh, would replace the loss of your precious son. But I must say that if one is, in fact, the uh, victim, as your son was, you have done such good in his name. And, you know, every year on L'Chaim, we replay our conversation together where you were just fabulous. But you also talk about the life and the, the meaning and in some way the inspiration that your son gave you and gave your wife and has given the world. And it is really, you are heroic and in, in death, your son was heroic too. Again, that is no comfort, but it is a statement, a description of reality. And all of us should hear it and understand it and thank you for it. Uh, Muhammad Ali was a devout Muslim. Did he, you know, it sounded as if when he was approached, and I don't know how he literally was approached, Yehuda, when he was approached, did the fact that your son was Jewish, that you were an Israeli, that your father had helped to found B'nai Brak in Israel, did that in any way influence him? Do you feel there was a moment of pause where either because he didn't like Israel or he didn't like Jews, he was reluctant to come out in support of your son's release? No, I didn't feel any of that didn't even cross my mind. It's only now that I read his obituary that I learn that he made several statements against Israel, but none of that came at the time. Mm. It was simply, I'll do it and I'll do it tonight. And Not only did. that, but he called me back. Yes. He called me back and said, don't forget to invite me to the welcome party that you are going to give when Danny is released. Lovely. He insisted on that. Of course, it didn't take place, but we invited him to the uh, memorial service. Yes. That took place at the Kerbal Center. And he was there, and I shook his hand. It was a big hand, I must tell you. <laughs> sure. It was such a powerful hand, but I, I, his face was full of humanity. Yes. And I told him uh, in my speech, and I said, Muhammad Ali, you are a champion of humanity. Lovely. Well, Yehuda, you know, I love you very much. It is always wonderful to speak with you. I appreciate the moments you've given us to talk about how Muhammad Ali did try, responded immediately, and did try to intervene on Daniel's behalf. I wish you and Ruth called Tuba Hatzlacha good fortune with the uh, Daniel Pro Foundation. I hope we speak again soon, and if you're ever in New York, I hope we get to sit together.
But I wish you all the best, my friend. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Mark, for having me. Be well. The thoughts of Yehuda Pearl, father of murdered Wall Street journalist Daniel Pearl, and the great Muhammad Ali tried to intervene on Daniel's behalf, sadly, tragically, to no avail. You know, I was at Columbia when Muhammad Ali won his first heavyweight fight against Sonny Liston. He was Cassius Clay at the time. And uh, I remember this dynamic, loud mouth, amazing fighter. And then shortly thereafter, he, of course, changed his name. And as I said earlier, there were many people who were very upset. Um, I was always drawn to the man. I always thought that what he was doing was courageous and that he was standing up to authority in a way that taught all of us how you stand up to power. And as time went on, we all learned that he was, a lot of it was a joke. And we had to learn that it was a joke. A lot of it was self-promotion in an effort to do what he needed to do. He was earning a living for himself and he was earning a living for his family and he did it the way he knew how. And it was in the boxing ring and he could promote like no one we had ever seen before. I don't believe there's a fighter who has ever been in the ring since Muhammad Ali who's been able to promote himself the way Muhammad Ali promoted himself. And then when his fighting was over, it wasn't about fighting anymore, or better said, it was fighting for justice. And he did it in a very soft, gentle, understated way. He did it throughout the world. As I said earlier, I do not believe the comments he made when he was a young fighter, you know, criticizing Jewish promoters, when he was in southern Lebanon and criticizing the state of Israel. As the man grew, he began to embrace more and more. And what he ultimately stood for was, a, again, a sense of courage and honor and a dogged determination to befriend and to fight for the underdog. And in so many ways, he embodied the best of social justice from the Jewish tradition's perspective. And so I was always drawn to the man. I respected him. I thrilled to him as an athlete. I know many people are violently, violently against boxing. I understand it. But within the sport of boxing, he was a, just a virtuoso. And so I am sorry he's gone. His fight for Parkinson's was also heroic and courageous and was inspirational to many people who have the disease. And we will miss him. He was in many ways the greatest. And we will have to say goodbye to the greatest, Muhammad Ali, who will live in our hearts and our minds forever. The line of the Jewish tradition is apt, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, the memory of the righteous will forever be a blessing. As always, my thanks to our director, Sloan Copeland, production coordinator, Serge Goldberg, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, and the producer of this edition of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.